Hello and welcome to the Race and Rights Podcast. This is Sahar Aziz, Distinguished Professor at Rutgers University Law School and author of the book, The Racial Muslim, When Racism Quashes Religious Freedom. I also serve as the director of the Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights, also known as CSRR. You can learn more about the center by visiting our website at csrr.rutgers.edu or following us on Instagram at Rutgers CSRR or on Twitter and Facebook at RUCSRR. The Race and Rights podcast explores the myriad issues that adversely impact the civil and human rights of America's diverse Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities at home as well as abroad. Today's podcast is entitled Refuge, How the State Shapes Human Potential, featuring Professor Hiba Gawayed, who has written a book by the same name. Drawing on a global and comparative ethnography, I speak with Professor Hiba Gawayed to explore how Syrian men and women seeking refuge in a moment of unprecedented global displacement are received by countries of resettlement and asylum, with a focus on the United States, Canada, and Germany. Our discussion shows that human capital, typically examined as the skills immigrants bring with them that shape their potential, is actually created, transformed, or destroyed by receiving states' incorporation policies. Since these policies derive from historically informed and unequal approaches to social welfare, the refugees' experiences raise a mirror to how states reproduce inequality. Let's hear what our guest has to say about this important topic. Welcome, marhaba, ahlan wa sahlan, Dr. Gawaiid. Thank you so much, uh, shukran gazilan. This is really an honor to be here for all the same reasons, but also to speak to, you know, Rutgers faculty and students who I've heard so much about. So today, you know, as Professor Aziz just very generously introduced the book, I'm going to be discussing uh, some of the preliminary or some of the actual findings of my book, Refuge, How the State Shapes Human Potential. Um, and I'm going to be giving a shorter than usual talk about it because I really want to leave as much time as possible for your questions, critiques, thoughts um, about the project. Centers the Experiences is a comparative ethnography that centers the experiences of Syrians as they began new lives in the United States, Canada, and Germany. Countries that offered them resettlement and asylum, which the United Nations identifies as durable solutions to the crisis of displacement. And by that, we mean, of course, human displacement. And in this project, I focus on the experiences of people who in Syria were part of the middle class broadly construed. They were skilled or semi-skilled, um, but not highly credentialed. And they arrived each of these countries, the United States, Canada, and Germany, between 2015 and 2016. And throughout this presentation, as a subtitle of the book suggests, I'm going to argue that human capital which is typically examined as a crucial determinant of immigrant outcomes, is itself structured through state incorporation policies. And I'm going to show that this process of production is both gendered and racialized. But before I expand on this argument, let me first give you a background of how these men and women became refugees, which is also an explanation of their selection into each of the countries that I included in this study. So the Syrians uh, in this study arrived, lived in cities like Homs, Syria's third largest, where this covered market once stood. And they became refugees due to a war that began in 2011 as a result of the government's violent response to civil protests for social change, the Syrian manifestation of what came to be known internationally as Arab Spring. The war took with it the sights and sounds of their neighborhoods where the families had long lived, the homes that they had built, and of course, the lives of many of their loved ones. Facing this situation, uh, people fled their homes, often to nearby areas, but then eventually they would fl flee the country. And at first, people fled to countries of immediate refuge. These are countries like Jordan, Turkey, and Lebanon, which continued to host upwards of 86% of everyone who was globally displaced. This influx created tensions with local residents, resulting in targeting and exploitation of Syrians who did not have legal status in these countries of immediate refuge. So for those who wanted to leave countries of immediate refuge, there were two possible solutions. One is resettlement and the second is asylum. And resettlement is where people are selected for travel to a third country based on a measure of their vulnerability, uh, which can be things like chronic illness, having a lot of um, young children, etc. Importantly, when offered resettlement in a given country, they can say yes or no, but they cannot choose the destination itself. Prior to the Trump administration, when refugees were admitted, 
the United States, as well as Canada, led the world on admissions through resettlement. Still, resettlement globally has always been a hyper-rare solution. So only 1% of those displaced are ever really resettled. And I imagine the numbers in the last couple of years has even declined further as resettlement opportunities, including the United States, remain limited. So for those not offered resettlement, the other solution to displacement is asylum. I'm sure many of you remember watching in the summer of 2015 as almost a million people, with the help of smugglers, made the treacherous journey across the Aegean Sea and blow up rafts and into Europe. Asylum is where one stakes his or her claim in a country that could offer them legal status by showing up there and applying. By some estimates, Germany took in about half a million Syrian asylees between 2015 and 2016. But by the time the Syrian men and women in the study had arrived to each of the United States, Canada, and Germany, they'd experienced a number of significant losses that sort of troubles this idea of resettlement and asylum as solutions, right? They'd lost their country, arriving to a new one where where the adet taqalid or norms and traditions were entirely different, whose language was not their mother tongue, and where there would be ethnic, religious, and racial minorities stigmatized by association to terrorism. They'd resign themselves to not seeing family for the foreseeable future. But what's more, they would experience a dimming of their potential. By this, I mean in countries of resettlement and asylum, their skills and abilities or their human capital did not have the same resonance that they did in Syria. And the question that I ask is why? So the term human capital, central to studies in economics, refers to individual abilities and qualities that make workers productive, often in an economic market. Sociologists have shown that human capital is an important determinant of socioeconomic mobility alongside the characteristics of the receiving context. And this is particularly true for first-generation immigrants. In other words, this literature shows that human capital and context together shape immigrant outcomes. Human capital in this literature is typically measured cross-sectionally as years of education or occupational histories at a moment in time. It's imagined as something that immigrants bring with them, an independent variable that then shapes other outcomes. However, this leaves the question, if one had five years of Syrian public school education or held an occupation as an artisan in Syria, how does this actually matter for their productivity in a destination economy? This question has been of interest as well to economists who identified what they call the quote, imperfect transferability of human capital for immigrants who are moving across disparate contexts. It's also been of interest to others who show that migration as a process is disruptive to human capital. And some have tried to explain this discrepancy. So human capital theorists explain it by suggesting that immigrants actually must lack necessary skills. Signaling theorists argue that this explanation doesn't make sense because skills aren't something you can see, they're not a tangible object or something that you can measure with a with a yardstick. Instead, they hold that immigrant skills and credentials are illegible to employers because they're foreign to them and they're hard to read, right? They're hard to sort of discern and that it's really irrelevant to whatever skills they actually hold. Yet other theorists show that the reading of skills is shaped by racism, or that the skills of minoritized groups are always seen as inferior to those of a majority group. However, all of these explanations continue to treat the immigrant as a puzzle piece entering the labor market puzzle. But what of the state which governs the entire process of migration? In this study, I introduce a theory of state-structured human capital to answer this question. Looking at the early period and through a comparative approach, that human capital can be created, transformed, or destroyed through the incorporation policies of receiving countries, which derive from national approaches to social welfare. I find that incorporation systems can intervene in two ways. First, they can recognize or ignore immigrant histories, seeing people as unskilled who may in fact have skills that could be activated. And this has always mattered for highly skilled immigrants, people like doctors or lawyers. But also, today I'm going to tell you about Amin, who arrives to Germany after working his whole life as a truck driver there. And I show that this history of working as a truck driver only matters if the German government recognizing it as mattering to becoming a truck driver in Germany. Second, states can invest in newcomer refugee skills so that refugees can translate their histories in ways that are productive in a new setting or enable them to acquire new skills that matter in that setting. So for instance, states can provide new language learning classes, teach refugees a new skill that is needed in the receiving economy that they did not previously have. States can also provide financial assistance to allow refugees to benefit from existing skill building opportunities. 
So for these reasons, I argue that human capital is not only a determinant of immigrant outcomes, but also an outcome, uh, an outcome, sorry, structured by state and corporation policies. I also show that the production of human capital is gendered. As scholars of gender have shown, institutions and services themselves feature gender expectations of who is a worker. And these interact with searing refugee expectations, where men are often primary breadwinners, resulting in different, as I will show sometimes, surprising outcomes for women and men. And I show that the production of human capital is racialized. Countries equip new arrivals in their pursuit of a good, stable life through the same racist social welfare systems that have long shaped the contours of national belonging. But what's more, as scholars of race have shown, discrimination and racist violence diminishes possibilities. Here we see it both in the denial of opportunities to minoritize people and through their own fear of being in public space. I'm going to show that this was an, a particularly bad for hijabi women whose identity is more conspicuous in Western context. Project also builds on broader work on immigrant reception. While studies of immigration have often focused on long-term outcomes or how immigrants fit into notions of a national whole, I join others who take what I call a human-centric approach, asking instead how a nation's policies work in the lives of immigrants. I focus on the understudied and crucial initial years in which newcomer histories collide with new systems to coalesce into their first designations of race, of legal status, and of, of course, human capital. And this early period is crucial as it shapes immigrants' starting positions in new countries. I also focus specifically on social welfare policies from which social assistance to immigrants derives. Okay, so what do these policies look like in the three countries I center in this study? What do the policies of reception look like? So first, in the United States, we have what we have is a liberal market economy, which owing to anti-Black racism, limits the role of the state and treats poverty as an individual failure. Refugees who arrive receive limited federal assistance and their only regular cash assistance is from temporary assistance for needy families, which is TANF, which is the national welfare policy introduced, of course, in 1996 with the welfare reforms. So the goal of this assistance and the goal for refugees as explicitly laid out in the 1980 Refugee Act is for, quote, self-sufficiency or that or non-reliance on government assistance. The idea that low-income people should quickly sort of depend on themselves rather than continuing to receive that assistance from the state. Canada is also a liberal market economy, but characterized by what's been called inclusive liberalism. So the social service system in Canada is generous, right? Think universal welfare. This generosity features two in immigrant incorporation premised on the idea of multiculturalism or the government's desire to integrate immigrants into the fabric of its society through investing in them. In this way, with the express goal of integration, refugees are met in Canada. Finally, Germany is a corporatist system, which means that the national economy is organized by coordination between the state unions and employers to the perceived or assumed benefit of all three. And this system includes high levels of expenditure on social programs, which uh, Meyer Marx Free, for instance, has described as producing the nation, which is seen as a nation primarily of Germanic people. So Syrians entering the system benefit from the generous financial assistance from the German state. However, it comes with conditions. To first to learn German and then to earn a German credential required uh, to enter the German labor market, something that 86% of all German workers also hold. So as a result of this, I call this third system one of credentialization. Okay, so how did newly arrived Syrians experience these systems? Before I get into data, let me offer a brief explanation of method. So to compile the neat data collection chart on the screen involved an ethnography conducted in three countries over the span of three years. And the project was conducted in Arabic, a language in which I'm fluent, and family selected in a language in which I'm fluent. And I would love to talk more about methods in the Q&A because I made a lot of decisions when writing this book centering this idea that I have that consent isn't a question sort of asked and answered, but an ongoing relationship of dignity and mutual respect. And so, you know, examples of ways that I did this is that and particularly took the human centric approach in my theory to this methodological approach is in the choice, for instance, not to use the term refugee unless I'm describing somebody's legal status. Um, versus using it, you know, uh, uh, to identify the person outside of that legal status. And I also, for instance, had people who uh, who were in each of the who had sought ref refuge in each of these three countries write an afterward to a book in order to sort of preserve their voice in the text itself. But for now, it's really important to know in order to follow the findings which I'm about to present 
is that the people in the study came from similar backgrounds. They were mostly middle-class people. Men had jobs prior to, um, you know, they had occupations. The women, for the most part, with notable exceptions, stayed home. And people arrived to each of these three countries in a similar time frame. So what we really have is very similar people having experiences that are differentiated by sort of which country they ended up in. Okay, so with that, let's get to the data. So to organize findings in each case, I describe how refugees experience their arrival and the assistance that they receive from the state. I then explore how each system structured the human capital of newly arrived refugees and how that experience was different for women and men. And I begin with the case of the United States and how men and women adjusted to the self-sufficiency imperative of resettlement policy. Here, I highlight the case of Roger and Mejid, who just seven years ago were a middle-class couple living in Homs, Syria, just around the corner from the covered market that I showed you earlier in the presentation. And in 2010, they finally achieved their dream of building their own home, leaving the foundations in place to build additional floors for each of their three children, the oldest of whom was a preteen at the time. Their enjoyment of this dream was short-lived, however. In 2011, they fled to Jordan, where Mejid, who had owned his own restaurant, became an undocumented worker at a shawarma stand. This couple, along with their three children, arrived to JFK in October of 2015. An international organization for migration van drove them from JFK to New Haven, Connecticut. They were dropped off in a dimly lit parking lot of an off-track bedding facility at the edge of town. They piled into the car of the resettlement agency caseworker and made their way to a low-income neighborhood of the post-industrial city. Their apartment was on the second floor of what used to be a single-family home, and they would soon realize that it had a mouse infestation. There, the couple would be visited by the caseworker who would tell them what their assistance would be. During this meeting, they learned about TANF, the welfare system, for the first time. They would receive $803 per month, the benefit of a family for a family of five. They would also receive a comparable amount in food stamps through an electronic benefit transfer, EBT, um, that could only go towards food items. At this meeting, they also learned that their rent was $1,000 a month, right? So the assistance is $800, but their rent is $1,000. So here's a budget of another family early in their resettlement. So because people don't read English, on the left is a clip art of each expense. And each column header is the month, which this family had translated into their uh, Arabic names. Yellow highlighter is the welcome money, federal funding, which is $975 per refugee, a one-time payment. And in green is what the family is expected to pay out of pocket. As you can see, for the first three to six months, uh, sorry, for, yeah, for the first three to six months, the resettlement agency will help the family pay their rent using a mix of this federal funding called welcome money, as well as donations to the agency. But then the family would be expected to pay half of their own TANF benefit to cover the rest of that expense. But when this assistance was up, TANF cash alone was insufficient to cover the rent. There was no discussion in this family as to who would find a job. As the household's breadwinner, Mejid felt that this was his responsibility. And this brings us to the issue of state-structured human capital tied to labor market entry. Mejid lacked an effective social network. His friends had also just been resettled and were as poor as he was. However, through a contact at the mosque, he was referred to an Egyptian pizza store owner. And there he helped in the kitchen. Mejid earned minimum wage at this job. Due to the nature of the job, however, he had no control over his shift. Though he tried to attend English classes, his work schedule was unpredictable. He also did not have the energy or time to study after his shift. Low-income work in the United States is characterized by this kind of precarity, unpredictable schedules, a lack of a living wage, and de-skilling. In Syria, the men in this sample were carpenters, electricians, contractors, chefs, and restaurant owners. When they met each other in the United States, they introduced themselves, listing their mehan, or occupations. In the United States, they did not work these mehan. They worked low-wage jobs. They were dishwashers, janitors, gas station attendants, where coworkers did not speak English and where they did not have the energy or time to attend English classes after work. So as one man put it, I want to work, but I'm new here. We just got here. We don't understand anything, but you want to push me to fishuni to work. So we work whatever. Hi Allah. Most work in restaurants, doing whatever. Everyone is working against their will. No one is happy. In other countries, they allow us to study, to get assistance. They say, you're not allowed to work so you can learn. Not here. Meanwhile, after the kids enrolled in school, Roger and the other women began to attend English classes in the morning. By staying out of the labor market, the women had the opportunity to build new human capital. 
The English they were learning enabled the women to do a series of tasks that their husbands could not. They could communicate with service providers and resettlement agency staff. They could advocate for their children in school and they were building up for the citizenship exam that they would take in five years' time. In addition, uh, within a year of their resettlement, most women took on some kind of income-earning work. The women utilized the skills that they previously had. For instance, Sorajet crocheted baby clothes and flower pins. 26-year-old Reda, whose husband Zofer had told me with finality our wives did work. She prepared halawat al laban and kunefa, which are sweets that her husband sold to other co-ethnics. And so in this way, the women reimagined their existing human capital for new labor market returns. However, as I learned when I began citizenship classes with this group earlier this year, actually last year, even for women, the gains were short-lived. None of the activities, because they were not earned with a pay stub, were recognized by the Department of Social Services as qualified work. The women could not receive limited federal child care subsidies to pursue them. And as families settled in, babies were born. Sada joked, Donald Trump is trying to keep Syrians out of the country, but look at us, we're making more Syrians here. With nowhere to leave their children, the women dropped out of English classes. Also into the work of Professor Sahara Aziz, it is important to note that women were hindered in their pursuit of language as a result of anti-Muslim racism. As hate crimes against Muslims spiked, including incidents against people in this study, they shied away from being outdoors on their own. Reda, for instance, stopped going to English class altogether after her family was attacked, and Rajet stopped going for a period of time. Five years after their arrival, none of the men and very few of the women had enough English to qualify for the citizenship exam, a crucial barrier to inclusion and protection against policies like the travel ban that reduce their feelings of safety and security in the United States. So now that I've given you the case of the United States, let me turn briefly to the case of Canada. So a drive 500 miles north of New Haven takes us to Toronto, where Denya, a relative of one of the families in New Haven, lived with her husband and four children. Denya has a laugh that can be heard ringing down the hallway of her apartment building, and her husband Bassem, who is a good deal older than her, owned his own restaurant in Homs like Majid did. When Bassem and Denya arrived in Canada, Costi, an organization that was managing resettlement on behalf of the Canadian government, housed them in a hotel. They could choose where they lived, and they chose to live in Mississauga, an area with a large Arab community. Other families chose to live in other places, but also next to other Arabs, and including other Arabs who they had arrived with. The Canadian government gave the families a startup allowance of $5,000 to cover first and last month's rent. But the government also provided new arrivals with standard issue new furniture for their home and cash assistance of $1,600 a month, $800 per parent, in addition to a Canadian child benefit of approximately $450 per school-aged child. After their first year, they could also receive welfare. And the Canadian government saw this transition to welfare as normal. They said when income support from the government or private sponsors ends after 12 months, in most cases, it is a normal occurrence for some refugees to transition to provincial or territorial social assistance support, right? Sounds very much like the American government. Um, Denny and Bassam's rent for a three-bedroom apartment in this high-rise was $1,400 a month, which they would cover and exceed with this assistance. So as a result, they didn't have to follow the timeline of families in the United States. They could wait to enter the labor market. In fact, they were incentivized to do so. And this brings us to the issue of state-structured human capital, right? Unlike in the United States, where men had to enter the labor market early and women were the ones who could learn English, in Canada, the opportunity was available for both women and men. So each morning, Bassem and Denya attended English classes. And when I met them, they were even able to have telephone conversations, which were something that is very difficult in a second language. And while there was variation in the sample as to who attended the English classes regularly, Everyone reported that they were available and that there were also other opportunities to gain education or skills. And while skills were in a sense uneven or recognition of skills was in a sense uneven, which is a huge issue in the Canadian case, you know, the existence of these educational opportunities to an extent offset that. So Denya, for instance, um, who hadn't worked before, told me in her usual jovial demeanor that Denya that cooks and cleans is over, halas. She was going to enroll in classes to do hair. So it's important to note that in Canada, too, there was hate crimes against Muslims, almost as high as in the United States if you just take the statistical difference. However, the families in the study felt, in a sense, insulated from this hate. And one of the reasons, I think, is that they could choose to live next to other co-ethnics, 
But also another reason is that Canada has an active policy of the promotion of multiculturalism and inclusivity by law, which means that these instrumental and symbolic supports do exist, whether that be radio programming in people's languages, but also the investment in language learning, which can contribute to a general sense of belonging. Okay, so finally, what about the case of Germany? So arrival in the German case of asylum is more dangerous than either of the cases of resettlement. And that's because people had to travel very long distances in order to get to Germany and apply there. So Iman and Amin uh, and their three children arrived in Germany in the summer of 2015. Amin is the long haul truck driver that I'd mentioned earlier, um, and he had been imprisoned in Syria. After he was released by the intervention of his boss, uh, the family decided that it was time to flee the country. First, they lived in Turkey, and then they got on the raft to Greece. And after an 18-day trek through Europe, including three days of detainment in Hungary, they arrived to Germany, but only stayed there because they couldn't afford to travel further to their intended Sweden. After a welcoming arrival in Germany that brought Iman to tears, they spent two days in a police camp in Leipzig, at which point they secured their three-year temporary residency. Um, this was a quick turnaround. Typically, the process in Germany takes quite a bit longer, and I'm happy to talk more about that, the legal dimensions of that. So Iman and Amin received assistance from the German government through the Job Center, where all unemployment assistance is distributed in Germany. And their rent in Dusseldorf was covered by the Job Center, and they received a basic uh, monthly amount that could exceed their needs um, and also allowed them to send money home once in a while. So like in Canada, refugees' language learning is the issue of first concern for the German government. However, unlike in Ontario, Syrian refugees are required to attend German classes under a penalty of the reduction of their assistance. So both Emin and Iman enrolled in class. And in order to secure work in Germany, they'd have to accomplish at least a B1 level of German. And this meant succeeding in four courses, three A levels and the first is the B level, which would take a minimum of a year and more realistically two, particularly for people who were illiterate in Arabic. The classes also taught basics about German culture and law. But then, if Amin wanted to be a truck driver in Germany, he would need to do a training called an Ausbildung for an additional three years. This meant that his experience as a truck driver, the fact that he'd gotten arrested and tortured in prison as a result of this occupation, was irrelevant. It wasn't seen by the German state as qualifying Amin to work. And this made the Syrian refugees feel inadequate. As Oday, a 31-year-old former mechanic, said, the Germans see themselves here, putting his head flat to his forehead. If you want to be with us, then you have to catch up with us. When you get here, it's like you're a newborn. However, for women and young people who didn't have prior work experience, the credentialization requirement, in a sense, cleared a pathway to the labor market. Yara, for instance, um, who had gotten married quite young and who dropped out of school young, felt that in Germany, she was going to become a dental assistant. Three years after arriving, she was finishing up her B1 and in the process of applying for an Ausbildung. However, here too, it's important to highlight the role of racism in shaping the experiences of new arrivals. The image of your screen is of hateful messages one woman received in her mailbox from a neighbor. Not only did new arrivals see the policies of the German state as exclusionary or a system that, quote, worked better for a German system that works well for the Germans, but also they felt that they were part, expected to relinquish parts of their identities to better fit into notions of German culture. In Germany, where Turkish people are a substantial immigrant minority, Estimated to be about 5% of the German population, the Syrians are racialized as Muslim in relation to this group that is perceived to not want to assimilate. And there was particular discrimination faced by women who wear the hijab, who, for instance, one of whom was denied an opportunity to get an Ausbildung as a daycare because she was told, quote, it would send the wrong message to the children. So now that I presented my data, let me conclude to return to my main argument. Um, the global ethnography advances the theory of state-structured human capital by showing that human capital, often conceptualized as a determinant of refugee outcomes, is actually a product of national incorporation policy and specifically whether countries are willing to invest in and recognize refugee potential. And this process of investment is both racialized and gendered. And there are three key implications that I'm going to leave you with, as I think we're probably over time. So first, in accounts of refugee crises um, and in international laws, as you all know, refugees are often cast as victims and receiving states are, that offer these durable solutions are cast as saviors. And implicit to this is the racist idea that life in the West is necessarily a privilege and therefore countries are accomplishing their humanitarian commitment simply by admitting refugees. But admission into American poverty is no one's salvation. 
Indeed, wealthy countries that receive refugees, including the United States, Canada, and Germany, are also complicit in the colonial legacies, foreign military interventions, and environmental degradations that create the very conditions from which refugees are fleeing. And within their borders, they too are capable of uh, violence, the violence of minoritizing, of denying living wages, of a non-recognition of people's humanity. This project captures how countries equip new arrivals for their pursuit of a good, stable life through the very same systems that have long shaped the contours of national belonging. Following, observing how human capital of those seeking refuge is structured reveals the ways in which it matters well beyond the labor market. Language acquisition is necessary for everything from making friends to securing citizenship in all three of these countries. And the ability to express human potential is also emotionally important. How would any of us feel if everything we had accomplished and built in our lives became suddenly meaningless to everyone around us? Finally, the study has implications well beyond the case of refugees or even immigrants. Through the design that follows the simultaneous experience of people seeking refuge who are strangers to the systems of social welfare, we raise the mirror to these systems themselves and how they shape inequality more broadly. The national incorporation systems that structure the human capital of refugees are the very same systems which low-income people have traversed across these three countries well before this cohort of Syrians arrived. Thank you, Professor Goweya. That was so informative. If you have not read her book, Refuge, colon, How the State Shapes Human Potential, I highly recommend it. And this just corroborates the tremendous value that your research has added. So first, I'll just say that there's a quote, a statement you made that is that you, you should you should put on a you <laughs> should frame, which is admission to American poverty is no salvation. And I think that very few people understand that that's effectively what happens, uh, unfortunately, through the refugee resettlement process, even if that's not necessarily the intent. I wanted to ask you more about what you think is the reasoning behind these different models of refugee resettlement. You laid out, to some extent, this labor market economic argument, implying that that tends to be, or I I presume, maybe the primary lens through which refugee resettlement programs are crafted. So one, is that in fact the reason why you have these differences? Or is there more to it that's based on politics, social norms, uh, views towards people seeking uh, refuge. Uh, But what explains this difference, for example, in the United States with the self-sufficiency approach, as opposed to Canada and Germany, which tend to be more, more generous? Why do they approach it this way? And why do you think America approaches it our way? Yeah, I think that, you know, and people have written about this extensively, particularly in the case of the United States. You know, I mean, I think that the work of Sibel Fox, for instance, is really indicative of this particular case, which is that the progression of the American welfare system is hinged on anti-Black racism and also against Mexican immigrants, right? So it's also anti-immigration. And the idea, you know, even with the 1996 welfare reforms, right, it's called the Personal Responsibility for Work Act. Right. So it's this idea that in the United States, we have this imagination of poverty because of sort of the racial inequalities that structure the United States. Fundamentally, we have this imagination of poverty as an individual failure. If you're poor, it's not structural. It's not because of segregation. It's not because your school is defunded. Um, it's not because you're you have chronic health issues. It's not because we're not investing in your health care. It's not because there is no mental health care in this country, for instance. It's because you are just not doing what you're supposed to be doing in order to make ends meet. And there's a really interesting book by Daniel Zuberi that compares what poverty looks like in the United States and Canada. So it's not that there's less poverty in Canada. The numbers are actually pretty comparable. It's that the experience of being poor in Canada is fundamentally different because you have these social safety nets. So dollar for dollar, you have the same amounts of earnings. Your experience of poverty in Canada is quite different. So I do think this notion of race and the division of race does matter because Canada has this understanding of itself as a multicultural society. It's not that, you know, that doesn't include racism, but it's this idea that, you know, we should work together and that people who are arriving should be integrated. And it's facilitated, of course, by skill-based migration, right? You know, in the 1960s, Canada and the United States kind of bifurcate, right? And for both for reasons of white supremacy. So in the United States, the argument is made that our immigration policy should be based on family reunification. And if it's based on family reunification, then it's going to stay white because prior to the 1960s, you know, white people were the ones admitted due to all the restrictive and racist immigration policies that we had in place. In Canada, the idea was to select based on skill. 
But what that means in Canada is that there isn't as much welfare, you know, concern, right? There isn't this image of immigrants coming to take our resources. And that's because the immigrants are highly skilled. So immigrants actually, um, you know, on average have better outcomes and better incomes than, you know, their Canadian white, you know, born counterpart, which is actually shifting in recent years due to changes, some policy changes. And Germany has an image of itself as being not a country of migration, right? So until the year 2010, they didn't even have, a, sorry, until the year 2000, they didn't even have a way for anybody with non-Germanic blood to become German. And they identified themselves as, you know, in their constitution as not being a country of, mig of migration. And so this homogenous, you know, imagination, despite the fact that it was a country of migration, but the homo homogenous imagination of Germany is what makes it so that it's a super generous system but it's structured entirely around Germans. There's no understanding of people coming from the outside. So I do think race plays a huge role in determining what these three systems look like and why we have such, such discrepancy in how people are received. How there isn't even an exceptional approach to refugees. I mean, notwithstanding mm -hmm. all of the flaws and racist treatment of low-income people in America, which is highly racialized. So... You know, putting aside that critique, which is a valid critique, but what's also interesting is that that our nation and our people and our law does not even recognize that when someone is new to this country, they're not even, they weren't born here. They didn't live here. Whatever circumstances they find themselves in when they arrive, whether they're coming with a tremendous amount of wealth or whether they're coming with only the clothes on their back as refugees, we don't even acknowledge that we don't differentiate between those experiences. And I, I find that to also be quite inhumane and completely contradictory to the concept mm -hmm. of allowing refugees in, acknowledging that refugees have a particularly uniquely difficult set of circumstances by virtue of how they've arrived. So that's a that's a great observation. Thank you so much, Professor Gawayed, for such an informative and enlightening presentation and for bringing a different perspective that unfortunately is not the mainstream one in the media, but I think as more scholars like you continue to write both scholarship and also uh, op-eds and, and other publicly accessible information or products, I think we'll, we'll hopefully start to shape public opinion that's based on accuracy rather than stereotypes and, and racism. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Race and Rights podcast. This podcast is hosted by the Center for Security, Race and Rights, housed at Rutgers Law School also known as the People's Electric Law School. CSRR engages in research, education, and advocacy on issues that adversely impact the civil and human rights of America's diverse Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities. We do so through an interfaith, cross-racial, and interdisciplinary approach. To hear additional episodes of the Race and Rights Podcast, check out our pages on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and everywhere else podcasts are available. Now, for a deep dive on these issues, visit our website at csrr.ruggers.edu, where you can find policy reports, teach-ins, and news commentary by our over 130 faculty affiliates. To watch our over 80 academic and public policy lectures, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights. And on social media, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Rutgers CSRR and on Twitter and Facebook at RUCSRR. Finally, you can financially support the Center for Security, Race, and Rights by going to our website at csrr.rutgers.edu and press the donate button. And please give generously. As always, be well and see you next time.